So we always start by where you grew up. Sure. Tell me, you know, what your life story is. <laughs> uh, how far back do you want me to So go? start with um, high school. Sure. So I grew up on Alden Avenue here in New Haven, uh, which is in the Westville neighborhood. I went to Hopkins, which is also in Westville. Um, went to foot school here in East Rock for grammar school. Went away to college to George Washington University for four years and then came running home to my, to my <laughs> folks after college uh, and was pretty determined to make a life for myself here. And what did you do uh, at university? What did you study? For? I studied electronic media, so that was a fancy name for radio and television. Okay. <laughs> so one thing, um, being in Washington DC, being in you know, the state the national capital, did that get your mind thinking about government issues? I think a little bit. It's hard to, I certainly I took poli sci classes while I was there. They were almost unavoidable. Um, my media professors were working in politics. Um, some were like ex-CIA, some were, you know, uh, uh, advisors to presidents. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, you <coughs> certainly agree that I'm not sure. But that's federal government. It's, it's very different than what we work on today, but it certainly is in the industry. Cool. So you spent four years down there, and you came back to New Haven, and when was that? What year was that? So I came back to New Haven in 2001. Um, I spent a little bit of time in Los Angeles before I came back, but it was very brief. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, surely, yeah, so I came back to New Haven in 2001. How's that for all good? good? All right, you gotta, you have to ping me when I, I will never have like this. The air conditioner is, is a bit yeah, loud. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you came back here, or rather, what were you doing in between? In between when you graduated from university and the time that you came back here in LA? Were you working on something? Were you chilling out? So, uh, in Los Angeles or when I... Both. Right, sure. So, in Los Angeles, I was working, I finished a couple classes at UCLA. I was working for <coughs> Universal Records. I thought that I was going to work in the music industry, though my senior your thesis was on the potential disruption of the music industry by uh, by the iPod um, <laughs> and iTunes, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember, it might have been Napster, I can't remember what the thing was, but one of the uh, yeah, <laughs> distributed music platforms. Um, and I, at some point, like I think I just really got disenchanted with the current state of the music industry was very uh, oligarchical, um, controlled by Universal and some others, and the music was shit, and so I just wasn't into it. Uh, so I came back to New Haven. Um, I worked at Bar, as a bar back. I worked oh. at Urban Outfitters for two days. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I kind of like at the same, in parallel, I started working construction again with my dad. Um, everything from swinging a sledgehammer to carpentry to eventually construction management. Um, but it just, but my heart wasn't always 100% in it, and I started doing graphic design. Um, uh, and so I was like doing some freelance graphic design. Graphic design at that time quickly led to web design. Um, there was no Squarespace or you know even WordPress was nascent, so. Uh, it was pretty easy to break in and build websites for uh, local organizations, and so I started to do a lot of that part-time um, while working for dad. Yeah, self-taught. Yeah, I took one class in college. Um, that was like a very like visual design with a learning HTML focus. So yeah, almost everything was self-taught. Um, so I started doing work for some national organizations, but. Um, probably the work with the New Haven Land Trust was actually the most influential on C Click Fix because we were, um, well, one, I, I had the opportunity to go out and photograph every single land trust garden in the city, which uh, it's a phenomenal organization at the time. There were 50 something uh, vacant lots in the city that they had occupied with uh, and activated with community gardeners. Um, they also run the seven nature preserves, and so I saw all parts of the city that I'd never seen before, even for someone who had lived here for you know, 26 years at the time. Um, but the, from a technical perspective, it was my first opportunity to work with the Google Map. 
Maps API, uh, which was, I think they released an API. Uh, so API stands for Application Programmable Interface. It is the way two uh, pieces of software, two platforms talk to each other. Uh, so it's a common language for sharing data. Did I do that okay? Ish? Good. All right. Good. You're, my, you're gonna be my gut check. Um, you guys can call bullshit when I say something. <laughs> um, so uh, the Google Maps API had just uh, been released probably in like 2004. We launched Six Fix in 2007. Um, I started to understand some of the design paradigms that were that Google was offering the world effectively in terms of how to think about how the real world intersected with the web. Um, it was really exciting. So let's talk about Secret Fix, you know, the founding story. Yeah. So uh, in 2005, um, I became a homeowner in New Haven on Upper State Street, which is uh, which specifically next to Blessings to Go in between Humphrey and Bishop. Um, at that point, I think I really started to dig into my neighborhood in a way I hadn't previously. I started a, a, a with with kind of an old school New Haven neighborhood activist, this guy Bob Fru. I restarted a, a neighborhood association that had been defunct for I think, 20 years at that point, maybe longer, maybe 30 years. Uh, it was last operated in 1982 or something. And so we started the Upper State Street Association, which was this business and uh, resident uh, improvement district um, without the without the tax classification. I don't know if you're wearing 501c3, so it's very unstructured. Um, uh, but we got a lot done. Um, and uh, it was my first foray into really working with both neighbors and government mm -hmm. to make the public space look like something that the neighborhood wanted it to look like. Um, at some point, I think I had butt my head into enough um, and of these like very transactional citizen to government interactions, me being a citizen or my neighbor being a citizen, mm -hmm. where it just became really frustrating. This specific incident um, that for me was a piece of graffiti on a Studio Z tattoo, um, which uh, was not going to be removed by the property owner, but it was this big nasty it, it was not like Banksy or Shepherd Ferry or, or a local version of it. Um, uh, and I wanted to get it off the building and so I kept calling City Hall. And at some point while calling City Hall, I realized that it was not going to be fixed. And I also had this moment of realization that my neighbors had probably reported very similar things, if not the exact same thing. And they were having the same problems. And, you know, on the other side, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could connect to my neighbors uh, around these kind of basic infrastructure issues that we were all trying to get resolved. So you have this idea, <coughs> we're going to start it. Yeah. You meet a couple people. Yeah. Tell me about that process. Yeah, so I started bouncing it off. This was like late. Uh, it was around Thanksgiving in 2007. I started bouncing the idea off folks. And at this point, I had trans transitioned from working for dad uh, to full-time freelancing from coffee shops. I was working from uh, its full time. Cafe now, but uh, I was bouncing back and forth between coffee shops owned by Duncan Goodall, um, who owns coffee and, uh, and that restaurant at the time. Um, one of the people, there are a few people who hung around there that were in government and uh, media, local media, who I was able to bounce the idea off of and get validation. Um, one of them uh, was Melissa Bailey, who was a journalist at the New Haven Independent. Um, they had been doing a little bit of crowdsourced open data journalism very early on. Um, uh, it was like a crime, pinpoint crime database in the Independent. And so I started asking her, like, hey, do you think it would be valuable if I, as a citizen, or you as a citizen, could publicly document some of these things that we're seeing that were broken in the public space? Um, and Melissa gave some pretty validating feedback really quickly. Um, I then uh, started to pitch folks like my eventual co-founders, um, who one of them had uh, substantial entrepreneurship experience. He founded uh, Fire One. Yeah. 
um, and was starting to think about what the next thing was, even in 2007 for him. Um, yeah, this was prior to Higher One's IPO. Uh, so let me just stop you for a second. How did you get in touch with Kim Miles? So Miles and I had been have been friends since uh, shortly after I returned to New Haven from GW. Miles went to Yale undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, we share some mutual friends. Um, I met him because. Uh, it was an ex-girlfriend situation, so uh, <laughs> okay. uh, his younger brother Cam uh, yeah. and I both dated women that were very good friends, and we met at the anchor. Okay. So, true New Haven love story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Miles and I met, and um, Miles was like in this very serious phase at Higher One, like he was like the boss of like a hundred people or something, yeah. right? And, you know, like everyone around him kind of like thought of him as the boss, and I just thought of him as a friend. And so, like, I got him into more trouble than he was supposed to get into when everybody was down, and uh, we hit it off right away. Um, and, like, I wasn't his little brother either, right? So, yeah. was, uh, so we had a real bond. Um, uh, and I think, you know, what we were working on at Cyclic Fit, like, some of the things that Miles and I talked about were, and Miles is a social entrepreneur at part, right? Uh, higher one was a phenomenal opportunity at the time, but Miles is certainly a social entrepreneur part. And so we just would, you know, we talked about making the world better. So I read, I read this piece of advice that he gave you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's essentially, how do you swallow an elephant? One small bite at a time. The key to solving a big problem is finding the first small actionable steps. Yeah. So would you say that he was somewhat of a mentor and advisor? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, everything from like thinking about like the next small thing that we could break off and attack um, to thinking at really large scale out of the gate. Um, I mean, that like it's that contrast that's really important, was important for me. It was like thinking about the massive opportunity while the massive global opportunity while thinking about the thing that's right at your feet, which is, you know, a good metaphor for what SQL fits with that also. So on that, let's just have a brief overview of what SQL fits is. Right, so if you see something that is broken in the public space, um, you can take out your smartphone, you can take a photo of the problem, uh, based on the location of your phone or where you decide to tell the phone the problem is, we will um, geo-populate a set of uh, service requests um, that the city can act on, uh, and then uh, you describe the issue, you categorize it, once you submit it, we send it off to government. Uh, and it becomes uh, a service request in, uh, inside of government. They communicate internally on the issue, pump information back out to the citizens, uh, um, and eventually close it out. The kind of unique thing about Secret <coughs> Fix is a traditional of a piece of government software um, is that it is implicitly social. So. If anyone reports an issue on C Click Fix and I'm his neighbor and I've reported an issue nearby, I'll get an email saying, hey, Alan just reported this issue. If you're interested in supporting it, um, vote here. And so uh, it has this kind of crowd effect um, to government that was um, So let's talk about the growth, how, how things went year on year. Yeah. So early on, um, Talking about this earlier, but we didn't know if we were going to be a business or a nonprofit or if we were to quit our day jobs. And uh, what we were really thinking about was just the community aspect of Sequoia Fix. And um, we had folks in China and Buffalo, New York using it within months of launching. Um, uh, but we also started to get traction in cities like New Haven, in Oakland, uh, California, um, where like deeper traction where citizens were coming back to the table and using it over and over again to the point that they were using it more than existing systems, be that an email form um, or phone system. Uh, and so we put enough pressure on the governments, uh, local governments, that they started asking us if we would build a tool for them to manage the service requests that were coming in. Uh, and so um, we built out a light software service model, subscription model, um, uh, that helped governments manage uh, that communication. 
called it Sequent Fix Pro. Um, at the same time, we identified that um, a local, uh, a national trend of um, kind of the change in national media trying to tackle hyperlocal journalism, mm -hmm. um, and there were a lot of people talking about potholes um, and trying to monetize potholes. Also, like the Boston Globe was trying to monetize potholes, right? The New York Times were trying to monetize potholes. So they were trying to figure out if there was an, a revenue strategy for for your neighborhood, right? An ad revenue strategy that was blocked by law. Um, we, there was a, a uh, so we had created this widget, which allowed Sequoia Fix to be portable and embedded on local neighborhood sites, um, government sites, uh, and we hadn't really thought about local media, but the Boston Globe, um, this is probably about 2008, 2009, the Boston Globe uh, was had like built their own Google map, potholes in the Boston area, it was probably in January, February, when pothole season was inevitable. Um, yeah, yeah, full swing. Uh, and I just called, called Eric Bauer, who's the head producer of the, uh, or the head editor of the digital side of Boston Globe, left a you know, two minute voicemail explaining the problem I saw with the map they had put in place. One, they had to actually manually enter every <laughs> pin on the you know, and there were like hundreds of them that were building up, and they weren't actually sending alerts to government, so nothing was getting fixed. And so I explained that one, citizens get in. You know, we can give them an interface, they can embed on their site in a couple minutes, and it would allow a user to show up, report an issue from the Boston Globe, and we would actually send alerts off to the local government. Uh, and we were on their website in a few days, uh, and we ended up building a decent business early on off of the media partners, um, which was pretty invaluable to our survival because at the time local governments were um, some in a state of bankrupt, but most of them in a state of uh, spending freeze coming off of the 2008 crisis, um, 2007 financial crisis. So um, we were able to monetize uh, the media partners in one of two ways. One, they paid advertising revenue uh, to where they offset advertising revenue to us by paying us a license, a monthly license, um, similar to our SaaS model with government. And two, uh, they, or the other option, they um, would just give us the ad revenue, so we would post Google Ads on so, um, It worked well, uh, though um, that market is not massive, um, and it's pretty consolidated. Um, so today, what is what, what, what are your revenue streams? Sure, so um, as government budget started to free up, we started to build a product that was had real return on investment for governments um, and created real value for governments. Um, our revenues uh, moved almost entirely uh, to a software service uh, model for government. Okay. Um, now, you know, you're talking about Boston. But let's talk about New Haven. How has New Haven been a great grounds for testing and yeah. fix, and how have they rallied support? Yeah, so um, folks like Mike Piscatelli who's in the room, where are you Mike? Mike was the director of traffic and parking when we launched C-Click Fix. He's now moved his way out in the world um, uh, and is now the, the deputy head of economic development here in the city. Um, but Mike was director of traffic and parking. Uh, Rob Smuts uh, was chief administrative officer. Um, there were some other folks in the city um, who were very receptive uh, to a new way of communicating with citizens. Um, and had they not been, I don't think they had a choice because New Haven is a city that uh, definitely is uh, proactive in communicating with their government. Um, but Mike and Rob both very clearly defined what they needed on their end of the communication for us to make the communication constructive. And there were some gaps. I think um, in terms of what was available in the market. Um, uh, in Mike's case, they had a system called CityWorks, uh, which is a work order system. Uh, and so I think the first integration we did with CityWorks was here in New Haven. Um, in Rob's case, he, he helped us more in the, um, 
kind of defining the features that were in SigClick Fix for government users that did not have a work order system. Um, on the, and they were one of our first clients as well. Um, on the citizen side, New Haven has one of the most active civic communities in the United States. Um, and uh, we knew enough folks to be able to get a lot of feedback from users in terms of what was valuable and what was sticky and what would help make this thing spread. And, um, you know, later on, on the employment side, a uh, very thoughtful and diverse community, and so we've had no problem with hiring here um, and retaining employees. Uh, specifically, I think, because we're a social enterprise, um, and with a highly engaged civic population, as well as an Ivy League uh, university that is uh, more socially focused than other Ivy League universities, um, Cyclic Fix has found a really good home as an employer. That's awesome. Um, so let's explain the uh, empowerment that Cyclic Fix gives to citizens. For instance, Maybe you've seen in the data, you go into a new city, you get a bunch of buy-in from the citizens. Does that city become more livable? Yeah. I think at an atomic level, I always think back to Miles' dad, who, <coughs> Miles doesn't even remember the story, but this is so, he only re remembers it through my retelling, but is, like. Is his dad a pastor? No. <laughs> a church? No, is that, no. Um, okay. No, but he is around, he's not here. Okay. No, uh, Ike, Ike is in New Haven um, okay. now. Actually, he's the only Lasseter left behind in New Haven. Um, uh, he's like a seven foot uh, Texan, you would notice him if you saw him on the street. Um, so, um, he, uh, Ike made a comment, or I don't think Ike remembers this either. So, okay, so two, two against one, it may be possible that this story is told. <laughs> we don't understand why it's important. So, when we were, first kind of pitching this idea and wondering if we should really work on it. Um, Ike said something about like post pitch about having it this like idea in his head that like he should be thinking about things that were broken in the public space. And he found himself like picking up litter more often just to, like in this moment of consciousness about the physical world around him. Um, and so for me that was like and, and definitely for Miles that was like um, the kind of the first moment of realizing that like reporting a pothole, reporting a street light that's out is a moment of engagement that most people just dismiss as something that will be totally hopeless and um, uh, not worth your time and so you just kind of dismiss government, you dismiss the public space around you, you deal with it, <coughs> but at the same time it's certainly having a psychological effect on you, right? Um, I think what we didn't expect, one, was that government was going to show up and fix the majority of these issues. So for like a sense of scale, two, nearly three million issues have been reported on Cyclic Fix and 86% of them have been fixed. Um, uh, and there, and there's like 15, over 15 million um, comments on there as well. Many of those are votes, so you can imagine that like the actual number of service requests that would have gone into government would have been many times higher than that. Um, and and then there's all the people who didn't report anything, who didn't vote on anything, but because of every issue is publicly documented, showing up in the local news feeds, and you know there's tens of millions of people who have eyeballs on this data who are seeing the response of government, it created this massive feedback loop that said, your government is listening to you, they are responding, it is worthwhile to speak up. Um, this may be not your vote at the election booth, but like this, this is your vote on it. This is your like very transactional way of participating in local government and your neighborhood on a day-to-day -day basis. And prior to Seek with Fix, there really weren't many ways to do that, if any, right? Like, it, and from a digital perspective, probably none. And so um, it's become a really interesting data set for civic engagement. Um, it's been the, the reason I get the fallouts in the bio. It's like those um, you know, uh, local academics and international academics and international 
um, impact investors and folks at the federal level and government are very interested in how this data intersects with, uh, to your point, um, the economy, crime, quality of life, um, and um, certainly it impacts all of those things. To me, uh, the reason it's so important is that at an anecdotal level, I've talked to a number of people who have told me they have chosen to stay in their home and not move out of town because of their connection to their government through the platform. And wow. so, um, you know, that has economic impact, that has uh, 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 diversity impact, cultural impact, I and mean, it, 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 that is what makes neighborhoods what they are when people choose to stay around and say, this is my place, this is what I want to be. Uh, and so that's, that's really important. So in the data, what are the most common things that you see that are problem? Sure, so illegal dumping is number one. Um, um, I think that there are probably more potholes than pieces of garbage dumped in the world. Maybe not, I don't know, but, but in terms of the application for the platform, a photo of illegal dump, well, one, illegal dumping pisses people off more than potholes do, especially if it's in a park that you love or in your backyard or your front yard. Um, but having photo evidence makes it really helpful for government, so it's really encouraged by government knowing whether you should be rolling a truck or not to go pick the thing up, or what type of truck. It also is a way to, in some cases, crowdsource volunteers to help pick uh, the garbage up. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. <laughs> <laughs> you recording this live to Senator Murphy? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what that was. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to see click fix Siri. <laughs> Siri says, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but potholes are a big one. Um, you know, tra there's a whole category of things that fit into like pedestrian, cycling, traffic safety. Um, certainly, emotions are higher around those things. Um, uh, trees that need to be planted, uh, code violations. Um, there's some more esoteric stuff around like specific government processes, like requesting for a certificate that happens that a get certificate. It's like people have really pushed our platform in different in different ways. What's so. the weirdest thing you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest thing I've said. Yeah. Dead animals get reported a lot. That's just gross. And it like changes by <laughs> jurisdiction, right? So you'll see like armadillos in Texas. Um, okay. uh, <laughs> um, I, I love it when I see people like helping animals out, right? Like reporting that it like, especially, you know, like, foreclosure situations, animals get left behind, neighbors will report that they want help. Um, so a guy in New Haven the other day, like, go across, maybe he's in the audience, I don't know what he looks like. <laughs> so to speak up or don't, we can talk about it privately, but uh, someone reported that, like, these, the mother opossum had been hit by a car, and there were, like, these three baby opossum. Oh. They were like, fine, I know, right? I felt the same way. I think some people were like, screw the opossum. Hot <laughs> possum. But, uh, um, but this guy, like, drove across town to go find the baby opossum to go help them out. Um, and he discovered, awesome. he discovered the issue yeah. once he could fix it. And he did. He's like a citizen. He did. Okay. Yeah, and someone had already alerted the animal patrol who I guess had come out. Um, I learned uh, from that particular user that possums cannot carry rabies because of the temperature of their I mean, you learn all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I took a photo, this amazing photo that someone took of an abandoned house, and there are three raccoons peering out of the window at the <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, what I'm really interested in is how people are bending the platform for true social change. Um, in a number of uh, snowstorms and disasters, the platform has been used for neighbors to help neighbors when the government can't get there. Um, hundreds of issues were documented by uh, missionaries in Crisfield, Maryland, uh, before FEMA could get on the ground in Sandy. Um, uh, which actually led me to be on a phone call with the commissioner of HUD, uh, the secretary of HUD, uh, the day after Sandy. Um, and the platform was leveraged substantially during that storm. Uh, a woman in Brantford uh, was able to get to the hospital and deliver a baby because an issue was posted on the site by her that she thought she might be going into labor and she wasn't sure, and it happened that the Fire chief was in a payloader. It's one of those big bucket trucks that clears the snow, um, uh, on, like a block away, and he was in 
notified by a secret fix user, yeah. right? I mean, it's like one of these things that would not have happened before the mobile phone. Um, wow. Uh, and she got to the hospital and confronted the baby before I was there. Most recently, folks have been maybe like one of the more nascent uses of it that's still being tested is for uh, equality in the workplace, especially around like labor standards. So everything from like OSHA safety hazard, and, you know, OSHA related safety hazards to um, wage inequality or wage theft, um, things like that are being reported, which is an interesting stretch of the platform. Um, what about police police issues? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and actually, like some substantial percent, like ten or fifteen percent of government users are police officers on Secret Fix. Um, there is a lot of non-emergency policing issues that go through the platform because the platform is historically, until recently, every issue that was reported was publicly documented. There, were anything that's an accusation of someone else doesn't really work well on the open web because of liability and slander issues. Um, however, we now enable uh, internal non-public reporting for things that um, are either mandated by laws being private, non foyable uh, Freedom of Information Act, uh, or um, would only be valuable where private, for personally identifiable information was required. Um, because if we were to ask someone that, we can set them up for Senate. So, um, so it is growing is the short answer. From a business perspective, we haven't targeted police departments. Uh, I think there probably is product market fit, but we just haven't gone after the sector yet. But the police officers as an institution of the city or an entity within the bureaucracy are already so um, Let's talk about the gamification. You have a point system. Yeah. Um, so we definitely grew up in the like Farmville era. Um, Farmville, for those who don't remember, uh, operated um, on the back of the Facebook app, uh, game, game exchange. Yep. Um, and it was, a, you know, I think the world was taken by storm by gaming at that time, right? Like Farmville was the first app that really touched all the people as opposed to just um, traditional uh, alpha male 18 year old man, right? um, and we knew that we were solving a problem that was there was a high barrier to entry for new users because people had grown apathetic with communicating with government we had to build trust um, and so we needed to motivate people to uh, show up and use the platform and so we have a civic point system uh, where people earn points, um, which are, don't have real world impact in most cases. Um, uh, and then you can like level up and get different badges. Um, we have not iterated on it since we were like working nights and weekends um, in 2008. Uh, it really hasn't moved forward. We have to change some of the names, or, like some of them. It, like the word Avenger has rubbed some people the wrong way, but one of them is Civic Avenger. Okay. Um, Jane Jacobs is the top level, uh, so that's like the top badge you can get. Um, and there's some concerns about uh, from some part of our community about what the Jane Jacobs means. Um, so what do you have? What, do, what points? Jane do you Jacobs. Do you, have, do you all know? How many people know who Jane Jacobs is? Awesome. Great. So Jane Jacobs. Um, was this woman uh, passed away a few years ago who uh, probably most uh, uh, famous for standing in front of um, the bulldozers of uh, real estate developers in New York City and some very uh, tyrannical bureaucrats. Um, and in that sense, uh, that is very much in the hearts of Seaquake Fix. Um, and she kind of was at the forefront of new urbanism. Right from, uh, uh, but it becomes more nuanced as you get into it, and you, it's probably a longer discussion there, but um, but she really stood up for neighborhoods and believed that communities should be driven by, the, the design of communities should be driven by the people who live in communities, and that's why we pulled Jane Jacobs up as the top level of uh, civic engagement. So you mentioned hearts, and, and I see the, the wrench heart logo. Yeah. What does that mean? Sure, so when we started out, uh, our logo was, uh, uh, fist with a wrench, and I like. I'm sure this was subconscious, but I didn't. You know, it was not. 
intended to be a socialist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and at some point, like if we had enough government partners, enough government partner cities, um, probably around like 30 or 40 government cities were paying us money. And some of them started to point out that like our logo actually made some of the government workers uncomfortable. Um, that we were like trying to start some kind of civic uprising in a mystic way, which we were not trying to do. Um, and at some point, I started to like government a lot more than when, um, personally, than when we started to see checks. We started to see you know, that there was like this really caring group of uh, um, municipal workers who deserved quite a bit more gratitude than they had gotten previously, for, including from us. Um, and so we needed to provide a logo that was more representative of a community that was partially about advocating for the change you wanted to see from the citizen perspective, but also about um, supporting the folks that would help make that change from the government side. This specific logo um, occurred because um, my co-founder, Cam, uh, got really excited about, um, do you guys know, uh, what's the humongous uh, Chinese rival to Amazon that makes everything? So Cam wanted to see what the experience would be like if we made something on Alibaba. Anyone to understand the whole like um, uh, uh, sourcing of parts from China? And so we made bottle openers um, for C-Click Fix. And I wish I had one on a good display. Um, and the, like, the, the, uh, the logo, our current logo didn't really work. And we were starting to go to this like idea of a robot with a wrench in the heart. And I had like, 3D printed some little robots with wrench hurdles. And, uh, but that wasn't going to work as a bottle opener. And so somehow this worked as a bottle opener. So you, could act, you can actually, it's a metal bottle opener. It did come from Alibaba. It was successful. Uh, cool. You could open it with the wrench part. And it kind of lingered like around the office for, you know, well, one, the, the bottle openers as a physical tool, like people really liked them and seemed to really resonate. And um, at some point, uh, Slate actually, who started to grow, became our head of product over at C-Click Fix. Um, he's, he's been very good at telling me when I'm crazy, but also very good at telling me that, like, he, I think he has a good sense of like, picking up on when I'm hesitant to do something, but like knows I want to do it. And this was kind of one of the things, and he's like, yeah, we should just make that the logo. Um, and so we did, and it has is, it is really resonated. Um, kids, you know, little kids will walk up to me on the street and say things to me, and, it, and my coworkers all have this experience, and uh, um, uh, people in their 80s will walk up to us and ask about the t-shirt, and TSA always has a comment at the airport. Uh, so good stuff. Um, <clears throat> tell me about how you've managed growth over the years. Um, or mismanaged growth, uh, either one. Um, either one. Yeah. So, early on, I mean, until really until last year, we were very, um, our burn was very, our cash burn was very low uh, because the market opportunity for government was there, but it would, they were slow to adopt. Uh, so, just throwing money at the sales funnel was not going to be an effective strategy. Um, you know, we we didn't, I would say we didn't have a really repeatable process for qualifying leads, governments, um, and, and closing them until um, starting in probably January of 2015. Um, at the point that we started to understand how we could create a predictable funnel through outbound lead generation as opposed to just grabbing anything we could that came in through email or the phone. Um, it became much easier to understand how we would uh, scale a sales team. Um, we have kind of a three-part, well, actually a four-part, a three-part sales team, but four people are kind of involved in the life cycle of a deal. So um, we have partner development reps who qualify a lead, um, either because it comes inbound or because they make an outbound cold call. We have an account executive who closes the deal. We have a project lead, which is the industry semantic is account manager who maintains the deal for the life of the deal. And then somewhere in between the AE and the AM, we have a, a project manager um, who um, really makes sure, while there's not, depending on the project, there's not much technical lift. If there's an integration there's, with an existing work order system, there is a technical lift, but otherwise you're just standing up a software service uh, platform, which is very uh, 
um, uh, kind of plug and play and um, control from the web interface and no technical skills needed. But um, irregardless of that, it's change management inside of government and it's getting adoption with the citizens. And so those things very much do take human touch. And so we had a project manager so that make sure that we get to a successful launch, which is in our world, that's the government admitting that they're launching. And at this point, they're like, there's like a press release and a blog post and there's, they're doing some other things that are saying we're working with Secret Fix and this is kind of the future of engagement and service requests in the city next. Awesome. Um, so I really hijacked the rest of us. There's a lot more answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, um, that's okay. Uh, how do you manage work and life? Um, that's a good question uh, and one that's really important to us. Um, yeah. If you look out the windows over there, you will see our windows on the third floor of the building next door. I guarantee that the lights are not on right now. Um, and they probably weren't on at 6 p.m. either. Um, most of my coworkers work 9 to 5 or 8 to 4. Um, we, I, I worked too much early on. Um, but three and a half years ago, uh, my world changed when I had my first son. Um, we have, uh, I have two kids now. Uh, many of my coworkers have children. Um, and uh, I am now strongly of the belief whether the output matters or not. Um, I mean, I family output above everything, but like, or, you know, success with family before work. But even with that, I would say that even if that's not what you're optimizing for, like, we have a highly productive office that does not, you know, when people are at work, they're working. And, yeah, and we're, we're really, you know, everyone is active in the community and with their families. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the president of the Make Haven, which is a yeah. space here on the block. Slate is the owner of the Grove. I mean, the reason it gets to operate is standing in the back of the room right there, but, you know, Slate still does own this place. Um, uh, people are active. Uh, Caroline Smith, who works for us, Nadine Herring, and Margaret Lee, I mean, they're like, you will see their faces all over the city at community meetings. Um, you know, and that, that, I think, you know, that keeps everyone going. It makes them, when people are working, they're really excited to do work and you don't have to look at those guys. True. Awesome. So I, so I got a couple of quick questions uh, to finish off. Uh, how many employees do you have now? 42, and there are four, uh, two, 43, and there are two job offers uh, currently. What are they accepted? Two job offers that are currently being set by their partner development reps. Yeah. Okay. Um, how much funding have you raised? Three point four million dollars. How many open issues are there at the moment? Uh, so there would be uh, like fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, fifty thousand. That's right. Probably fifty thousand. Um, how many? It's too late. <laughs> how many partner cities do you have? Just one more. Um, to two hundred and eighty-five. Okay. And which part of New Haven are you living in now? Westville. Westville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Awesome. Well, we'll open up to some Q and A.